back in 1991, 1989, we started, uh, we had the groundbreaking for this new building. Dr. Thomas Zimmerman was with us on that Sunday as we uh, broke ground to start this new building. We were in construction for a number of months, and in January of 1991, <clears throat> this church was finished. Actually, it was finished in December, but I didn't want to move in in December. I wanted to make sure that the church was completely finished, and I had a month to come in here and pray and to condition this sanctuary before we had the dedication and before we brought our people in here for the first time. I wanted to condition it with prayer. I wanted Holy Spirit to come and find a lodging and a resting place here before we moved in. I didn't want to be in too big of a hurry. Construction lasted for 13 months. This building program lasted for three years totally. That's the financial, getting the financial package together. Our bond program, the architectural stage as well as the actual construction. We dedicated this building January the 13th, 1991. That was the week that the Gulf War broke out between Kuwait and Saddam Hussein. And the first week that we had services in this building, we moved from the chapel across the street to this new building and the building was completely full like it is now on that January the 13th. There was a lot of tension in the air People were going to stores and buying prophecy books. They were getting everything they could get their hands on concerning Bible prophecy because many people in America thought that the Lord may be coming. And this church filled up. And I have to be honest with you and tell you that even after the Gulf War stopped, that we, that we fell back a little bit, but not much. And the church was going wonderful. I was in here one day by myself praying, and as I was walking around in the sanctuary praying, I said to the Lord, I said, God, I ought to be happy. By all standards, I'm a successful pastor. You bless me. We've been on television here since 1986 in Pensacola. <clears throat> The church was full, the income was up so we could pay our bills, lovely family. I had everything a man could be thankful for. I had it all. But I was in this church one day walking around praying and I said, God, I'm so lonely. I hurt. And I said, God, why am I so lonely? And I remember I walked around and I thought, I ought to be the happiest man on the face of the earth, but I feel so empty and lonely. And I heard the Lord say to me in my spirit, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard the Lord say to me in my spirit, He said, if you will return to the God of your childhood, and if you will make this a house of prayer, He said, I will pour out my glory here. And I remember the Lord began to speak to my heart about how to do that, and I won't get into the logistics and the details of it, but the Lord gave me a plan on how to truly make this a house of prayer. It took a while to implement it, took a while to sell it to the different departments of the church, the staff, but they caught the vision. And for the first year that we made this a house of prayer on Sunday evenings, the devil was on my back, on my shoulder, in my ear, every Sunday evening, and he kept saying to me, you're gonna lose your crowd. You're gonna lose this church. If you don't go back to Sunday night evangelistic service with preaching, you're going to lose the people. You better stop this prayer now. And I had to wrestle with that every Sunday evening. It was torment. On one, one part of me loved to come in here and have our praise time, our worship time, and our prayer time. But another part of me, my soul drew back because the devil painted me all kind of pictures that if I continued that, I was going to lose the Sunday night crowd and lose the church. And I remember we had been praying for about a year and a half, close to two years. And as people would gather around the prayer banners to pray, 
We would spend the first five minutes going over requests, prayer requests around each banner. There were 12 banners, and if you spent five minutes around each banner praying, you'd prayed an hour. And I remember we was in here one Sunday evening, and we'd been praying for about, we just started, we just started the five minutes of sharing the prayer request, and after five minutes, the music would begin to rise slowly. Those that was over the prayer banners would begin to stop their talking, and it was time to pray. We'd been praying long enough for the people to be trained to know that once they heard the music come up and the voices die down of instruction, it was time to pray. I was up there in the balcony on that right-hand side of the balcony at the Leaders of Our Country banner. And while I was standing up there, I remember I heard the music coming up, and as I was standing up there in the balcony, I heard what seemed like it's hard to describe, but it seemed like something opened in the church. And it seemed like the prayers of the people intertwined and made like a huge rope or a pole or something. It's like they all came together, and it's like they were rising up like a missile, like a rocket out of this church going through the top of the church. And as I could sense that sensation of those prayers coming together in unity and beginning to rise, I heard the Lord again speak to me, and he said, if this church will continue to pray, he said, I am about to pour out my glory in this church. In 1991, I was in a workers' conference back in the back in the cafeteria. We had about 300 people there that night, and as we were getting together and discussing the plans for the year, I remember a woman came to the back door, and she uh, is a woman in the church, a very quiet woman. I never had talked to her personally, but she'd come to the church for years. And she walked in the back door while I was up speaking, and she just got my attention, and she said, I need to see you as soon as you're finished. I said, okay. So I went ahead and finished, and then after I got through, I made my way back to where she was, and she said, Brother Kilpatrick, she said, I just came in from Seattle, Washington. And she said, uh, I was at a meeting where Dr. Cho was. And she said, my plane has just landed. I left the airport and came straight here. And she said, I heard Dr. Cho say that God, he was praying about the status of America. Was God going to pour out his judgment on America or was he going to send revival? And she said, I heard him say that God had not reserved America for judgment, but that he was going to pour out his spirit again. And contrary to before, as the Holy Spirit visited from the west coast to the east this time, he was going to start on the Gulf Coast in a little seaside town called Pensacola, Florida. And she said, I come here tonight, Pastor, to tell you that Dr. Cho said God was going to break out in Pensacola, Florida in a powerful way. And I remember after going through that building program, that was 1991, I heard that prophecy and it went in one ear and out the other. Not that I didn't trust Dr. Cho because I've always believed in him and I've always loved his writings and I believed in his ministry. But I had gotten to the point that prophecies to me, I'd heard so many that hadn't come to pass, I didn't put too much stock in them. Not that I despise prophesying, but I just didn't put too much stock in them. And it wasn't until after revival broke out, John Starnes came over for a Sunday night service. And he sang with Jimmy Swagger for so many years, and he came in by on a Sunday night service, and he said, John, you know, Dr. Cho prophesied this for Pensacola, and that's the first time it came back to my mind. Revival had already broken out. And I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, I was just with a pastor this morning in Mobile, Alabama. And he said, that pastor in Mobile told me that he had heard for quite some time that Dr. Cho had prophesied God was going to move in Pensacola, Florida. And he said, so he went over there to the World Congress, World Pentecostal Congress. And he said he tried to get to Dr. Cho the whole time and couldn't reach him. And he said the last day of the Congress, he was in a hotel getting ready to leave. And he said as he was getting ready to check out and leave, Dr. Cho and a delegation of men came walking through the lobby of the hotel. And he said he just stepped out in front of Dr. Cho like this and said, Dr. Cho, he said, I'm from Alabama. And he said, I have heard rumors that you said that God was going to pour out his spirit 
in America in the last days, and he was going to start in a little seaside town called Pensacola. He said, Dr. Cho shook his finger like this and said, no rumor, no rumor. And that was the first time that he came back to my mind when John Starnes brought it up that God, God had used Dr. Cho to prophesy that God was going to pour out his spirit here in America. Last night I met with Dr. Cho at the airport, and today I had lunch with him. About all I could do today at lunch was weep. I wept just about the whole meal. The presence of God was so real and so strong. I know that there's a destiny somehow about what God is doing. I don't completely understand it. I wish I did. I wish I had the details. But I know that there's somewhat of a destiny about Pensacola. I know that there's a destiny about what God is doing here. And I know that there's a reason why he's here tonight on April the 23rd, 1998. He could have come in 1995. He could have come in 1996. He could have come in 1997. But he's here tonight in April of 1998. And I said, why are you here now, Dr. Cho? He said, Holy Spirit said for me to come now. So I want you to listen to me tonight. We are in the midst of a major revival. There's been 2.4 million people through these doors since 1995 on Father's Day when God visited here. God sent evangelist Steve Hill to this church to work side by side with me and me side by side with him in a revival that God is using as a harvest to touch not only America but the world. <clears throat> we see it, we understand it, but we don't fully comprehend it and we don't fully feel it. Even though God is using this place <clears throat> and God is using Steve and he's using all of us, I want, I want everybody here to understand we don't feel any way boastful about what's happening here. We don't feel any iota of pride. We feel humble. We know that it's God. We know that before God showed up in our lives, we were desperate like everybody else. We're just thankful that he showed up. We don't know how much longer this is going to last. But I do believe tonight that God is in Dr. Cho being here. I am also aware tonight that in this building, this building is filled with preachers. After a while, Brother Hill is going to come after Dr. Cho gets through addressing us. And Steve is going to give an altar call. I know this building here is full of ministers and their spouses. But there's also hundreds, if not thousands, of people outside this building right now and other buildings that have come for revival. Many of them need God. Many of them are lost. Many are here and they don't even know why they're here. And they're in other buildings. And after a while, when Brother Hill gives the altar call, many of them are going to find the Lord as their Savior. But I want to share this before Dr. Cho comes. I can't define for you and explain to you what I feel, but I do feel that all of us is here somehow tonight providentially. It's almost like a snapshot was taken years ago, and then here we are tonight fulfilling that snapshot. And I would also like to say, too, that when he comes to speak to us, I want us to hear what the Lord says. I believe tonight that God is going to use Dr. Cho in a powerful way. I believe that even things will come out of his mouth that will surprise him. Because we're on holy ground. And I want to share with you tonight that I believe that there's a tremendously jacked open, wide open heaven over this place. I want to proclaim and say this as a man of God. I believe that Pensacola is on the verge. I believe it's quivering and quaking and on the verge of this entire city falling to Jesus Christ. I believe that. 
I believe that many of you are going to leave this place changed. God's brought you here to hear, to experience, to feel, and to move in this realm of glory for tonight. You're here for a purpose, and I know Dr. Cho is here for a purpose. And it's with a great deal of pleasure and honor that we welcome him to our pulpit tonight. Would you please welcome Dr. Paul Youngie Cho. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You may be seated, please. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kilpatrick, for your invitation to this pulpit. A long time I wanted to come here, but uh, the Holy Spirit did not give me permission to come. But this time, the Holy Spirit commanded me to come to deliver his message. And uh, I've come here to deliver not only God's message, but personally, I wanted to be soaked by the Holy Spirit here. <laughs> So I have that tremendous desire to receive the blessing of God here. 1961, all of those years in Korea, we've been praying for the revival in America because I always felt that we were greatly indebted to America. When the communists invaded Korea, then America sent soldiers to deliver us from the communistic attack. And 50,000 American young people died in Korea to protect Korea from the communism. So I always felt indebted deeply to pray for America. And I asked all of my Christians to pray for America every day, especially Sunday and Friday all night prayer meeting. And in 1961, early part of 1961, I had a meeting in Mobile, Alabama, and I was so burdened down in my spirit for America. I said, Father, are you going to give up America? I plead with you. But for America, there will be no Christianity existing in the whole world. America is the bulwark against atheism around the world. Then suddenly the Holy Spirit came into my soul and Spirit said, don't worry, I'm going to send great revival to America. Yeah. Then the Holy Spirit said, this time I'm going to, going to send my revival through this Bible Belt in the su southern part of America and this Pensacola area. So I was greatly encouraged. But I'm always afraid of prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very careful. Through my ministry of 40 years, I've been always asking God to give me the gift of the healing. In our prayer mountain, when I go into prayer grotto, I always ask God to give me the gift of healing. I never asked for the gift of prophecy. <laughs> because I saw so many false prophecy through my ministry. But whenever I prayed for the gift of the healing, God would prophesy through me. So I said, Father, I don't need this. I don't like to have the gift of prophecy. Give me the gift of healing. But uh, God is a sovereign God, and he decided what he wanted to do. And he always gave me the prophecy. And uh, I went to the Seattle, Washington, to preach at the Brother Casey Treat Church. Again, I was in hotel, and I was praying and praying, praying for the America. Suddenly, in my vision, I saw the map of America. 
And I rose up in my vision and I pointed my finger on Pensacola. Pensacola is such a small town that I did not know too well. And God asked me to declare the revival wind to start to blow from Pensacola. So I said, who am I? This is foolish. Why should I stand up in hotel room and command the revival to come in Pensacola? <laughs> I felt very foolish. But God said, didn't I ask Ezekiel to command the Holy Spirit to come into the dead born? He says, you command. So I commanded the Holy Spirit to come to Pensacola. And then I announced that prophecy to the congregation, trembling. I was so scared and frightened. Then it was 1961, but nothing happened in 1961. Nothing happened in 1962. Nothing happened in 1963. And now, here people began to write back to me. Yes, are you real prophets? You prophesied a great revival in Pensacola, but nothing happened yet there. Are you sure that you gave a right kind of prophecy? And I really repented. I said, oh God, I should not have given that prophecy. I said, God, you did not show me the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So I'm afraid if I were going to become a false prophet. But when I heard the great sound of wind from Pensacola, I was relieved in my heart. <laughs> Well, I started my ministry in 1958. We started preaching at the server of Seoul City with my mother-in-law, late sister Choi Cha Sil. She was a great prayer warrior. In 1959, Dr. John Hurston and his family joined with us together. So we started to pioneer work there. Those days, Korea was very poor after the war. Whole society was in chaos. And people were objectively poverty stricken. But we put up the tent and we began to preach. And those days, I prayed very much. I prayed but five hours every day. Not because I was spiritual, but I had nothing to do. <laughs> I had only five person, only five person in my congregation. And I had a great desire in my heart. I said, Lord, if you would only give me 300 person to my church, I will never complain till I die. <laughs> my vision was very small. I could not think of beyond the 300 members. The strange thing was that whenever I knelt down and prayed, suddenly in my spirit I see 3,000 people in my congregation. And I shook my head and I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I said, this is impossible. This is totally impossible thing. I don't even have 30 person, but here I see constantly 3,000. So when I open my eyes, I see old 10 church with five person. But when I close my eyes, I see 3,000 people in my mind. <laughs> the spirit in, impressed in my heart with the number of 3,000, day in, day out. 
And so naturally, by and by, I was completely brainwashed by that vision. <laughs> and I was pregnant with 3,000 people. And soon, I began to act as if I were a pastor of 3,000. I began to work with dignity like this. <laughs> and I was speaking as if I was speaking to 3,000, and this five person would put finger into their ears and say, Pastor, <laughs> don't shout. You have only five person. You hurt our hearing. But I would say, no, I'm speaking to the 3,000 people. And they all laughed. They thought that I was joking. But I was serious because I was pregnant with 3,000 people. God put that vision in my soul, and I did not know that how that vision could be fulfilled. Then in 1959, Dr. John Hurston and his family joined. And 1961, Brother Hurston and I went out to the downtown of the city. He brought money from America. And we purchased the land and built a church. And by 1964, we had 3,000 people. <laughs> In my own life, God always put his visions and dream my soul first. Then God gave me a great faith. First I would receive visions and dream from the Lord. Then I would pray with vision. I would never pray with empty mind. I would have a clear vision in my mind. And I would pray with a vision. Then soon that vision would produce equivalent faith in my soul. In my life, it always worked like that. Church revival always started first in my heart. Then that appeared in my reality. So when I had 3,000, I was really satisfied. Then the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart. If you lift up your head and look to the north and the south, east and west, and see 6,000, I will give you 6,000. So I accepted. And I dreamed and I prayed. With vision, I prayed. And after a little while, God gave me the faith. I believed. Then soon, we had 6,000. Then we had 10,000. I was very satisfied one morning. <laughs> I came to church, and I laid down my uh, attache. I said, Lord, I'm satisfied. I have good church, good income, good home, wonderful family. And what man could desire any more than this? I'm satisfied. Then the spirit says, you are finished here, because you said that. He said, resign from this church and go to another place and build a church with seat with 10,000 people. And this time you should do it alone. Dr. John Hurston will be gone. And your, your mother-in-law will leave you. You must do it alone. I said, Lord. Why do you ask me to pioneer free churches? I've already suffered enough, first the church and second church. And why do you ask me to go to third church? God said, I'm sovereign, don't answer to me. Go. Then I had that vision in my heart. 10,000 people in my heart. But we had no finance. We had only $1,000 in our account. And to build a church seating 10,000 people, I need millions of dollars. 
So, I discussed with my deacons and elders, and they sat down and they would not talk anything. They were afraid of the being levied with a heavy tax. And uh, some of the elders spoke up and said to me, Pastor, you are a young man, you don't know the economy of this world. This is no time to purchase land and build a church. Whole nation is suffering and you can't get money. So after the committee, I began to pray. The Spirit said to me, when did I ask you to bring my decision through your committee? <laughs> when I speak, you should obey. That's all. You should never, never discuss about my decision. Go ahead and build. So, I said, yes, I'll do that. And from that time, I kept this vision, and I prayed, and I was so frightened and scared, and I prayed and prayed and prayed. And one day, I had a great faith given in my soul. So with the vision and faith, I went to the city, purchased the land, Yedo Island, I patched up the land with credit. Then I made a contract with a contractor to build a church without having any money. And from that time on, I was living mostly in prayer. Because when I open my eyes, I see the reality. <laughs> I was shaken up. And when I pray, I live in the vision. I see the hand of God. And then the war broke out. Yom Kippur war broke out in Israel, and oil shortage came. And our people began to lose job and bank closed the door. And the creditor came upon my neck, and I was sitting the rock bottom. I was struggling. And I was in a terrible situation. Then all of my Christians began to gather together underground of the unfinished church, and we had prayer meeting. Every night we would gather together, and we were pouring our heart, and we were praying. And I was praying to God too, desperately. But in my mind, humanly speaking, there was no way for me to get millions of dollars in this situation. I knew that I would have bankruptcy. And all the denominational churches and Christians were expecting that the Pentecostal church would have a bankruptcy. They were all my Job's friends. They would come and comfort me, but they were enjoying my bankruptcy. I'm sorry to say it this way, but they really did that. <laughs> and newspaper began to attack me and even my dear friends in our own denomination began to attack me. So I had no friend. But in very, very cold winter evening, about 2,000 people gathered together underground of that unfinished building. And we were praying, but we were desperate and I felt hopeless. Then one very old woman came out trembling. She was about 80 years old. She said, Pastor, would you please give me your microphone? I said, Sister, go down and sit there. Don't harass me. I have problem enough right now. <laughs> I thought that she was senile, so I said, you go and sit down there. But she was crying all over her face. She says, Pastor, just please give me a microphone for five minutes. I want to say something to the people. So to quiet her down, I gave her a microphone. I said, only five minutes. She said, folks, we've been praying for God to answer 
to finish this building. She said, I have no husband, no children. I'm living by the support of government. I've been saved under the ministry of Dr. Cho, and I have a tremendous hope of going to heaven. Soon I will go to heaven. And I'm coming out here every night praying for this church. But she said, just by praying, we are not reaching to any place. It's when Jesus Christ was in the wilderness. A boy brought five bread, two fish. And we must bring five breads and two fish to God. Then we should pray. Without sacrifice, our prayer means nothing, she said. Then she unwrapped something from very old yellow newspaper. And it was a banged up old brazen rice bowl and chopstick. She said, this is all what I have in the world. This rice bowl, I eat out of it every day, the chopstick. And I want to give this rice bowl and chopstick to the work of God. She said, I can eat food out of cardboard. Instead of using chopstick, I can use my gnarled finger. But she said, I have no money. This is all what I have. And I want to give this to the altar of God and pray. And she brought that old bend up brazen rice bowl to me. My heart was so broken. I was convicted. I said, because I started to build this church, I'm even robbing this old woman of the old rice bowl which she has. I was broken down. I was crying. I said, Grandmother, I can't accept that from you. I'd rather die. I'd rather give up my ministry than exploiting you. No, I can't accept. She crumbled down. She was crying. She said, because I'm an old widow, because I give a very poor things to the Lord. You are not accepting me? And she was crying. Then suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon the congregation. All the people began to cry. All the people began to cry. The Spirit began to blow like a mighty wind. The Holy Spirit used her dedication. And then people began to stand up and they began to make pledge. People began to give their home their whole year salary, and they began to give everything. And one night we received more than one million dollars there. At those days, dollar was very strong, you know. I could not believe my eyes. Suddenly, the door of heaven was open, and people all began to dedicate. And I received money, and I completed the building. And in 1974, when I was having a dedication, Billy Graham came and he dedicated our church. And we had a minister seminar. Thousands of the interdenominational ministers came to our church. And every one of them praised the Lord. And they came to me and said, we knew that you could make it. <laughs> <laughs> but brothers and sisters, I tell you, when you have vision and faith, God intervened. In most of the difficult cases, in unbelieving way, God intervened. Then, after the dedication of the building, God said, if you can have visions and dream of the 3,000, I will give you 3,000, uh, 30,000. So, now it's easy for me to have that kind of visions. So, I had that visions and dream in my heart, and I began to pray. I should pray till I have faith. Vision is vision. But when you become pregnant with vision, then you should pray till that turn into faith. And I prayed and I believed, and then our church grew to 30,000 and 50,000. Then I was traveling in Australia. I was having a meeting there, and I came to the Perth. 
Then they had a airplane stri strike. In Australia, when you go there, you should expect a strike at any time <laughs> because they're striking country. <laughs> So I was stranded in Perth, and I could not leave. I was in a beautiful Sheraton Hotel, but I was anxious to come out of that country. But every day, there were arguments between the labor and government, and there were no plane leaving to Australia, and I was desperate. And I was studying the Bible, and I was praying. At that time, the Spirit said to me again, Joe, lift up your head. Look to the north and the south. East and West, the land which you see, I will give you. I said, why don't you just give me that land right away? <laughs> the Lord spoke to my heart. Seeing comes ahead of possession. First you must see, then you will possess. So if you could see, 100,000 members in your church and believe I will fulfill it. I said, Lord, I can't handle 100,000 people. I can hardly handle the 30,000. I'm not well educated. I'm not able person. I can't handle 100,000 people. But God said, when you believe, you will have 100,000 people and you will handle 100,000 people. So, I believed. After one week, I came out of Australia and I came back home and I told the story to our people. I said, we are going to have 100,000 people. We should purchase more land, we should enlarge our church. Two elders stood up publicly and protested. He said, you are false prophets. You are exploiting the people. We can go together with you. He said, we will fight to the last moment. You can't do that. But I said, I'm doing that because I'm servant of the Lord. Servant is supposed to obey the Lord. That's all. And the two persons who fighting me, they were going around discouraging people not to give money. But I believed that we went on enlarging the church and purchasing more land. And before we complete the enlargement of our church, we had 100,000 members. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Then again, in prayer, God put the vision in my heart. If you can embrace half a million members, I will give you half a million members. I said, no way. <laughs> I cannot handle half a million people. I said, Lord, don't you know that I am high school dropout? <laughs> I have no college education, and I'm dumb here. So. I cannot handle half a million people. But God said, my Holy Spirit can do that. You are not doing the work. The Holy Spirit in you will do that work. I'm just using as my vessel, point of contact. If you can embrace the vision of half a million, I will do it. I said, Father, why don't you choose a better person? God said, since you are poor, I use you. Talented people, they cal calculate too much. But since you are fool, you don't calculate. <laughs> it was shocking. God said, since you are dumb, I'm using you. So it's okay, thank you. You are right. I don't know how to calculate. You know, I'm so dumb that I'm afraid of the computer. Whenever I see a computer, I'm scared. 
In my office, I have hundreds of computers, but I'm afraid of even touching the key because I'm scared. <laughs> so I ac accepted that God's project. I, ac I was pregnant once again with that vision stream. And in a few years, we had half a million members. And I took my wife to Japan. I said, let's have a vacation now. <laughs> we have made it. And we can't go beyond half a million. And I said, I sacrifice you and the family. When you have a big church, you sacrifice your family. I had no time to go back home. Mostly I slept in my office. I worked for 24 hours. And so my wife and children were sacrificed. I, ha I have three boys and all of them left home. Now they are having wonderful family, wonderful boys. But when they were leaving home, they come to me and said, Pastor Cho, We know you as a pastor, not as father. And that is the reason we don't like to become a pastor. We needed you in our juvenile time, but you were not in home. So we know you from pulpit, not in the home. That is still hurting my heart, but you can't help. If you really want to have a real growing, powerful church, your family should cooperate. And I'm so happy that my wife has been cooperating with me all these years. In other words, I would never have been used by God this way. So I said to her, now this, we have half a million members, and surely I tell you, I can handle any more than half a million people. So from now on, we will have a lot of time together. We will have a lot of travel. She will not answer. So I said, you know, I'm telling truth this time. But she says, since you got married, you have told me many a times like that. But you have never kept your promise. But I said, now it is real true. Half a million people. And uh, we can't expect anything more to happen. But she didn't answer. So next morning, we were having a family devotion together. I was praying together with her. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And again, he gave me prophecy, which I did not desire. <laughs> Even nowadays, I tell you, brethren, I'm afraid of prophesying. And I'm very careful. But when I pray, the prophecy comes. How can I do? The Spirit gave me the prophecy. And the prophecy came out. It's my son, you can have vacation when you come to heaven. <laughs> this is no place for you to plan for the vacation. You must work. He said, go back home, plan to have a one million members in your church. And I opened my mouth. I said, this is God's mistake. He can't entrust one million people to me. No way. And I said, dear, don't believe this prophecy. <laughs> but she said, OK, you go ahead and purchase more land, raise more money, build more church, and set up more satellite churches, because I knew that you would never keep your promise. <laughs> so we packed them, came back home, and we began to enlarge our church again. Now, in my own church, under my direct ministry, we have 700,000 people. But I have studied uh, hundreds of satellite church. And when I send out my associate, usually I chop out uh, certain numbers of the cell system, least 3,000 to the 5,000 people. I give three to 5,000 people 
with several millions of dollars. You go and start your work there. So I chopped out my whole area. And by that way, I started hundreds of churches. And many of my satellite church has more than 100,000 members. So if I include them, we are far beyond a million members. But even right now, I have 20 satellite churches directly under me. And most of those churches have 5,000 to the 30,000 members. And sooner or later, I'm going to make those satellite churches all sovereign church, giving out to my associate. So our church, God has started. And God has shown me how to manage our church through cell system. I train the lay Christian, especially lay women. Women are wonderful workers. You know, when I come to America and Europe, I always challenge pastors to use women. But American and Western ministers, they are afraid of using women. I don't know why. But women are wonderful workers for the Lord. Yeah. Out of 50,000 cell leaders, 47,000 of them are women. And I have 600 full-time workers, two-thirds of them are women ministers. Number one, women are very faithful and they don't compete with pastor. Well, so far in my ministry for 40 years, many of my men associate, without getting my permission, they split church away and they try to start their own church. But uh, I've never had any woman do that. They've been faithful to me. So it's very safe to use women. <laughs> <laughs> and also, secondly, women are telling women, women talk. Men will not talk too much, but women talk always. So I said, tell a woman, tell a woman. When you make a woman cell leader, they talk in beauty parlor, they talk in the marketplaces, they talk with uh, meetings in friends. They can't just talk about Jesus in our church. So through cell ministry, just purely through the cell ministry, every year we are harvesting more than 50,000 people. Since 1958 and until now, our church is uh, exactly like in the situation of Pensacola here. We have been having continual revival because God opened the door of heaven and God began to pour spirits in our church. And people come from all over Korea and from Seoul City to our church. Every day we have prayer meeting and we have, even nowadays, 13,000 to 20,000 people come together to pray. Every day, spring, summer, autumn, winter. Even last Wednesday, I conducted Wednesday prayer meeting, then I came out to the airport to come here we had 20,000 people in 11 o'clock service during daytime. So we have great revival continually for 30 years. Brother Kil Patrick just before said that we don't know how long this revival will continue. I tell you, this will continue till Jesus comes. In Korea, we could embrace the revival by training the lay Christian. By training lay Christian and by making them the cell leader, 
they open their home around city, around country. And suddenly the they begin to gather together five to ten family and they have their cell meeting. And as the cell grow more than ten family, then they have cell split and they start another cell system. So by training the lay Christian and by making them the labor for the harvest, we could embrace the continual revival, not only in the central church, but to each home. We spread the revival fire from our central church to each and every home. So they carry revival from each and every home. And my Christian members, they left Korea and they came back to America as immigrants, all the cell leaders. And without getting my permission, they start cell system in America. And among the Korean immigrants, they started more than 600 churches here in America. And they moved to the South America and they started hundreds of churches there. So we are spreading the revival through lay Christian. They become the messenger of Jesus Christ and they embrace the revival and they go all over the world. So our revival is spreading throughout the country by training the lay Christian. One day, one young couple came to me and said, Pastor, we are leaving Seoul and we are going to Incheon, which will take about one hour drive. And uh, we are going to buy a home there and settle there. I said, OK, fine. You find a good fundamental church there and attend. He said, no, no. We want to open our home and we want to have a cell system. And then on Sunday, we will hire a bus and we will bring our cell members to your church. But I did not pay much attention to him. I said, okay, if you like, you do that. But after a few years, she came to me and said, Pastor, would you come to our area and have a meeting? I said, you know, I'm a busy person. I can't even go to Incheon to visit your family. I said, no, not my family. I said, I opened the home as you taught me, and we started a cell system. And we began to have a prayer meeting. I invited the neighboring people to our home, and we testified, and we taught, and we began to win one by one. And then we multiplied our cell system, and we have hundreds of cell systems. Now we have totally 3,000 people there, and we rented an auditorium. They have never seen directly our pastor, so we want to see our pastor. I said, 3,000, I'll go. <laughs> so I, when I went to Incheon, the auditorium was packed up just because of this young couple without having any fanfare. Very silently, they were touching their neighbors and cell began to multiply, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. And all of these people were there. And those people who could come to church, they would come by bus. But otherwise, they would only come to the cell. So I sent my associate pastor and I let him start church there. Now he has 50,000 members there. It's a thriving church. It's sovereign, independent. It is very difficult to start church in Japan. Japan is a, is a tomb for the missionary. It's killing. Unbelief is terrible. Then God spoke into my heart. You go and start church in Japan. I said, Lord, I've been mostly holding meetings in Europe. I like to continue my ministry in Europe. I don't like to come to Japan because I was growing up under the Japanese occupation and I all remember those atrocities that they carried out for the Korean people. 
And also, I have a great inferiority complex against them, so I dislike to go. I said, why don't you send my mother-in-law to their father? <laughs> Well, she was my uh, co-worker. I loved her, but I was being harassed by her very much. <laughs> when my mother-in-law comes to my home, I have argument with my wife. When she leaves, we have peace in our home. But when she comes, she always agitates my wife. And so we would have argument. So I said, Father, why don't you send my mother-in-law to Japan? She's a good woman. She'll have a tremendous work there. But God said, no, no. He said, you start cell system in Japan, and you go there. So I prayed very much, and I chose one woman. She was also Mrs. Choi. Choi. She was uh, one of associates in our church. And I said to her, she was not the best uh, the preacher, because best preacher I needed, I just chose a mediocre one in, among my associates. You're the best one I need in my church. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 I told her, I said, you should go to Japan. And I only give you one-way ticket. <laughs> you become a kamikaze there. <laughs> if you can't plant church, don't come back home. She was crying. She said, I'm not the person. Pastor, please choose another person. No, you are the one. <laughs> I said, you should go there. And you should start cell system. I said, don't try to hold a big campaign. Don't try to rent a big home, uh, the, the auditorium. Just uh, rent uh, your own house. Open your house. And invite neighbors and start cell system through cell, Kunko, Japan. So I gave her one-way ticket. No more money. I said, by faith you go and you pray. She went to Japan and downtown Tokyo. She rented a very small house, small room. And she began to fast and pray. She fasted and prayed for 20 days. The landlord was scared. One Korean woman came and she would not eat. And she would fast and pray and she was uh, really pale and emaciated. And so they were afraid. So the landlord came and they said, why don't you eat? We are afraid. You are going to die. She said, no, I'm Christian. I'm praying for the salvation of your soul. And by and by, they were one to Jesus Christ. Then by fasting and prayer, she began to pray for neighbors and visiting the neighbors and invited them to come to house. You know, people, they are afraid of coming to church, but they are not afraid of visiting the neighboring house. So one by one, they come. And she began to organize one cell, then two cell, three cell, she began to have dozens of cell. Then she sent me a notification, Pastor, come. We will rent a hall and we will have a meeting. So I flew to Tokyo. And when I went to the auditorium, she had around 100 people saved there. So we started church. And we began to penetrate Japan through cell system. Japanese people, they are addicted to television. They will not come to church. Every Japanese church has between 15 to 20 people. And pastors are suffering terribly. But we went through the cell system. And now in Tokyo, we have two churches, which both of them have 5,000 members. 5,000 members. And we started churches all over Japan. We have about 50 churches in, in Japan, all through cell system. You are the ministers, and I'm minister. And I tell you that if you really develop this cell system, you structure your church this way, 
then you can multiply your ministry through your lay Christian by the hundredfold. And uh, many people come to me and say, wow, you have magnificent church. I say, no, this is a cement building. We are only gathering together Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, all our prayer meetings to celebrate Jesus Christ. This is not our church. Our church is not here. Our church is in that apartment house, in that university, army bunker, and in marketplaces. Our churches are there. We are not in the building. We are outside the building. We are only coming to the building to receive education, encouragement, edification. But our churches are there, outside. I always say that to have a growing church, we have three types of ministry. Peter's ministry, James and John's ministry, and Paul's ministry. This is uh, symbolic. Peter was called into ministry while he was casting the net. Pe many ministers, they are trying to fish human soul by the fishing rod, one by one. You can't fish too many souls. You must cast a net all over the city. You must cast a net over the town, over the city, and pull the net. Then you will have 100 people saved. And personally, individually, minister has no strength to do that. When you get organized, you are sell leaders into the big net. Get them organized from house to house, from town to town. You can make a big net of cell system. And you train the cell leader. You encourage them. You motivate them. And then they open their home. They don't need any specific uh, uh, the, the auditorium. They open their home. Simply they invite their neighbors. And then, without having any fear, they talk each other about Jesus. And when they come, they have coffee, even ashtray. Unbelievers, they come and smoke. So they have ashtray, but they talk about Jesus, and they ask all the questions, and, and the cell leaders answers and pray for them. Then by and by, they become born again Christian. They come to church, and they receive baptism, and they become normal members. So you need Peter's ministry, very, very necessary. When you read the Acts, they were having service from house to house. And your house can be the sanctuary. And then you need James and John's ministry, because James and John were called into ministry while they were mending the broken net. Your cell system is going to be broken very often. Many of the cell leaders, they get discouraged and they would leave their ministry and they would move from another city. And suddenly, there appeared a broken net and the school of fish, whoosh, leave through that hole. So you need many associates, hundreds of associates. You divide them into the certain area and they should rush to fill the broken net. So James and John's ministry, they should mend the net. So I have 600 of my associates. They are all appointed to the area constantly, and they are watching. They go there, encourage cell leaders. They build up cell leaders and teach them. And whenever cell leaders uh, fail and the broken net fail, they fill in right away, then raise up another cell leaders. And this region, my associates, they are very busy on the field, every day they go around and watch cell leaders. So our church ministry is done by the lay Christian, not by ministers. I always say to the ministers, you don't go and lead the cell. You encourage cell leaders to lead. Let the lay Christian build the church of Jesus Christ. So they are there to encourage cell leaders and train them and motivate them. A James and John's ministry. Then I have the Paul's ministry. Paul was called into ministry while he was building the tent, church's tent. So when they bring all the fish to tent, I feed them. I'm, many people come to me and say, so you are terrifically busy. You have 700,000 people to take care of. 
you have 1,000 elders and 50,000 deacons. You think of that. All of those are sometimes thorn in my flesh. <laughs> you know? And they say, you be terribly busy with all the committee meetings. Then I should operate our daily newspaper. We have one million circulation every day. We have a powerful Christian newspaper. We are influencing government and whole society. And I did not start the newspaper because I liked, but they forced me to do that because unbelieving world began to attack me very ferociously. And uh, this uh, secular newspaper, news media began to attack our church and my personal life terribly. But I had no pulpit to speak to the world. Then I was praying to the Lord as Lord, I'm being attacked, but I have no chance to speak to the people and explain. God said, why don't you start your own pulpit? You start your own Christian newspaper. Shame on you that you are complaining. <laughs> if unbelievers, they have newspaper, why don't you start your own newspaper? I said, that's right. <laughs> so when I contacted a specialist, the specialist said, you would need seed money to start newspaper at beginning, $10 million cash. Then you will need $3 million to operate the newspaper for at least five years to make it to break even. And if you don't have $10 million as a seed money, and if you can supply $3 million every month, don't start. So I came to God. I said, Lord, I don't have that money. $10 million, then $3 million cash every month. How can I manage? The Spirit said, you are f fool enough to do that. <laughs> so don't calculate. When you bring your vision and dream through your committee, the vision would come dead flat. Usually when God gives you the vision, it seems to be so foolish that if you bring that vision to the committee and when they begin to uh, estimate by logical mind, that vision would be killed. Again, I brought that project to our committee. Our committee is no way. No way. That is a foolhardy thing, and you will lose whole church. And again, I pray to the Lord, Lord, my committee says that I'm doing a very foolish work. God says, yes, that is right. You are fool, so go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't carry your Japanese computer. Don't carry calculator. You know, God, that was a great blessing to me. Even nowadays, I always say that I'm fool. I'm dumb. There's reason I trust God. I'm not trusting my calculation. And uh, I always try to see Jesus, not wilderness. When Jesus went out to the wilderness, there were 5,000 men and tens of thousands of women and children to feed. And when Jesus called Philip. He was very talented. Philip, feed them. Philip said, no way, sir, no way. This is wilderness. We have no bakery. We have no money. We can't feed them. But Andrew, Andrew was a little bit slow. He was, had a low IQ. <laughs> so instead of calculating, Andrew saw Jesus in the wilderness. Philip saw the impossibility things. No money, no bakery, no time to feed. And Andrew knew that. But Andrew saw Jesus in the wilderness. It's Jesus is my resource. If I have Jesus, I think we can feed. So he got the five bread to fish and he brought to Jesus. And Jesus multiplied and feed them all. So I always try to see Jesus in the wilderness. Many people, they only see the wilderness. Oh, this is wilderness. This is no time to purchase land. 
This is no time to build the building. This is no time to start television work. This is no time to send missionary. But when God speaks, look to Jesus in the wilderness. He is your resource. So by dint of faith, by looking to Jesus, I launched into this newspaper. I purchased all of this uh, machinery, computers, and everything. Oh, it took money. And I began to publish newspaper on all the Christian world welcome because we were now giving the pulpit to the ministers to speak to the government and to the world. You know, up until that time, ministers were speaking only from the church pulpit. But now they start to speak from a newspaper pulpit. And the uh, whole politicians in the business world and unbelieving world began to listen to the claim of Christianity and preaching of pastors. And our newspaper began to grow. And I was supplying the money. And after about five years, our source completely dried up. I had no money to operate newspaper anymore. I had not even any money to give salary to my workers. And after one Sunday service, I was desperate. We was crossing over the Han River Bridge. My wife is a musician. She's a music professor. So she was sitting beside and she was uh, looking through the musical note and she was uh, writing down something. And I was sitting there and I said, Father, is this my last time of crossing over this bridge? As we are at the point of bankruptcy. I can't operate newspaper. I am hanging on the cliff. Then when I lift up my hand, someone was hitchhiking my car. I was so frightened. We were driving very fast. In front seat, someone was hitchhiking. My chauffeur was driving and someone was hitchhiking. And I look at him. He turned around, he smiled. He was Jesus. I've never seen Jesus hitchhiking car. <laughs> he was smiling. So I nudged at my wife. I said, Jesus is here. He's rare. In front seat, she looked at me. She said, you are crazy. I don't see any person here. <laughs> you are worrying too much. I said, no, no, honey. Jesus is here. She says, shut up your mouth. <laughs> but I saw Jesus. And Jesus was smiling to me. And Jesus says, what's the matter with you? I said, Jesus, this newspaper, I can't manage. Take too much money. And all the fun dried up. Jesus says, who is the president of this newspaper? I said, me. I said, that's right. Then the fund is going to dry up. <laughs> Then I said, Jesus, then who is the president? He's me. If you recognize me, I will perform miracle. But if you take my position away from me, you will dry up. So I said, Jesus, I turn off everything to you. I turn off everything to you. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm happy. I was shouting. I was shouting. Instantly, all the burden lifted up from my heart. And Jesus took all of my burden and he left. Since that time on until now, we have been operating this newspaper for 10 years. And we are the fourth largest newspaper in Korea. We are mightily influencing whole nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm the tent maker. I'm in the Paul's ministry. So I should operate newspaper. Then we have a wonderful university. And we have the largest social work in Orient. We gather together all of those uh, derelict young people on the street and bring them, clean them up, and giving them a free board and education, technical education, and make them a good Christian and good technicians. And we also take up the old folks and we have the world's largest prayer mountain. They say, oh, you will have so many works, so much works. But brothers and sisters, when I come to my office, 
I give an instruction to my associate, and I meet few people before noon. Afternoon, I have nothing to do. <laughs> so I go for playing golf. <laughs> you, we ministers, we are burning up ourselves because we don't delegate our work to our lay Christian. I delegate all of my work to my associate and to the lay Christian. I delegate. And I encourage them and motivate them. And I train them and they do the work. You know, in the church, God raised up the apostles, the prophets, and pastors and teachers to equip the lay Christians so that they may serve the body of Jesus Christ to grow. We are there to train them. Have you ever seen general going into the front line and shooting the pistol and gun? Then that army is broken army. The war is fought by private soldiers in the front line. General is sitting far in back line, looking into the map, sipping the coffee and tea. <laughs> Pastors, you are the general. You are the general. You are not supposed to go into the front line and fighting the battle. You are not supposed to go and visit from house to house and knock on door and try to win the soul. That is not your job. Your job is training the lay Christian, encourage them, and, and, and praying for them. Let them go out and do the work. Sheep give birth to sheep, not shepherd. In my church, I have tremendous work. I praise the Lord because this is not my work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit always remind me that I should stay in the office and I should pray and plan and I should educate people. So our church is growing. Fantastic revival fires burning through because I have a lot of time to pray. Every day, I try to pray more than three hours. And when I come out to the evangelistic field, usually I pray for five hours. And people say, why do you pray so much? Reason why I pray so much. Because if I don't delegate my ministry to the lay Christian, I will not have time to pray. And our church has been growing because of this tremendous prayer effort. I pray, number one, because God want me to have fellowship with him. God has tremendous need in his heart. You see, God is almighty. How could he have need in his life? I tell you, God is love. Love wants to have fellowship, you know. When you love your husband, you would like to have fellowship with him. When you love your wife, you want to have fellowship with him. So God is love. He has a bottomless desire to have fellowship with his children. There's reason he called you. There's reason he created you, because God wanted to have fellowship. So ministry unto the Lord must come before the ministry unto the people. People are so busy ministering to the people that they neglect God. Then finally, they lose God. They lose touch with God. So you must always put God first in your life. And I always put my God first in my life. When I had 3,000 members, I came to the crossroad. Up until that time, I was visiting all home with Dr. John Huston together. We were having a, 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 a prayer meeting. We were praying for the sick every day, and we were visiting home. And I was completely exhausted. When I come on Sunday pulpit, I was unprepared. I was tired, and I was ineffective. Then I come to the crossroad. The Spirit said, you should not exhaust yourself. You should be ready to be used by me. I can't use a tired minister. You should have an abundant rest. You should abundantly pray it up so that I may speak through you. But our Christians, they all ask my time. They ask me to visit. They ask me to counsel. They ask me to help them. Finally, 
I needed to decide. And I said to my board members, I said, now I should spend more time together with God than with people. And they said, you are going to lose church. People will leave our church. But I said, I should make decision. If they leave, let them leave. But I want to spend more time with God. So I began to spend more time with God, studying the Bible, praying. Then on Sunday and Wednesday, I began to give a very rich message. Rhema instead of Logos. Very rich message. And instead of leaving our church, people came by the multitude. So nowadays, I know that I'm the vessel of the Lord. I should be very carefully take of my health, of mind and body. And I want to take an abundant time to study the Word of God, to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and to prepare for the pulpit. And if I please God by spending more time together with him, then he anoint me abundantly. So there's a reason I pray. God always called me to pray together with him. And when I pray with him together, he gave me a lot of the visions and dreams and prophecies and something like that. And secondly, I pray because without prayer, I can't maintain the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You know, to take care of all of this vast church, I need a tremendous spiritual strength. If you don't have spiritual strength, then you can't protect your congregation. Devil is out there to rob and kill and destroy. And you are always having a spiritual battle. We are at war against spiritual power. So if I am not full of the Holy Spirit, the devil come and begin to steal away my sheep. You know, like David, when he was tending his father's sheep, then the lions and uh, uh, beasts would come and grab hold of the animals and leave. And David went and took hold of the sheep and pulled the sheep out of the mouth of the bears and the lions. It's so like that. Bears and the lions, they attack your church and your members. And if you are equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can protect them. So when I prayed up enough, then on Sunday when I stand on the pulpit, every service I have 50,000 people directly under my ministry. Then through a satellite, about 200 churches are joining with me together, my uh, satellite churches. And uh, when I stand and look at the vast crowd, I always say, how can I handle them? How can I pull their attention? But when I prayed up and when I am full of the Holy Spirit, they are on my palm, that vast crowd, more than 50,000 people. They are on my palm. I can handle them. But if I did not pray it up enough, I come to church and I cannot handle them. The people are jittery, they talk each other, they look at the watch, and then try to compensate. I shout more, I shout more. You know, I just try to fill the vacancy of the spirituality with a loud voice. And I become hoarse, I become completely exhausted. But still I fail. So I pray more than, if I pray more than one hour, I can break through the resistance of the devil and I can go into the spiritual realm. Every day when I pray, my flesh say, rest today, start praying tomorrow. And my joint painful and my eye pain on my backbone and I become itchy all over the places and my flesh says, don't pray today, you can pray tomorrow. Then the devil would come and says, rest, rest, don't pray today. I should fight against my flesh, I should fight against the devil, almost always one hour. And I shake them off, then I go into the spiritual realm. Then I can really enjoy the presence of God. So when I pray more than one hour at least, then I can maintain the Holy Spirit. And when I come to church, so many people come, they are sick with cancer, arthritis, and, and the blind, 
and they are all dying and they are waiting for me. And I preach to them and I pray for them and they are healed like that. Great miracles. You know, I don't lay my hand on the people because still God has not given me the gift of healing. I've prayed for the gift of healing for more than 30 years, but still he wouldn't give me. But he gave me the faith. I announced the healing. And there's a reason my healing in my ministry comes by word of faith, not by laying my hand. When I lay hand, I lose all the faith in my heart. I can't believe. Just the last Sunday, a woman came with a smashed vertebra. She came to America to visit her sister and she fell from the staircase and she had a broken backbone and she was uh, hospitalized for one month in America and doctor could not cure her. So she was carried by airplane to Korea and she was hospitalized in, uh, in a Chinese medical doctor and uh, they gave her uh, acupuncture and uh, Chinese herb medicine, but she was getting worse. She was paralyzed. So husband carried her to church, and I was conducting the meeting. Suddenly the spirit showed me that uh, one woman who was having a smashed vertebra would be healed. So I announced, she stood up, she walked out, she was healed. So see, So if I prayed up enough and when I have the presence of Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit carry out ministry. People take me as a spiritual servant of the Lord and that's a great mistake. One day I could be very spiritual, another day I would become a very fleshy. When I am full of the Holy Spirit, I am a man of God, ready to be used by God. But if I don't pray enough, and when I have argument with my wife, and when I come back home with good clothes, with a holy attitude, but I'm empty shell. No power comes out of me, and I can't help people. You know, I'm just a plain point of contact of Jesus Christ. Jesus used me as a, a point of contact to touch people and let his power flow. And that is the reason I don't think that I'm a holy person or spiritual person. I'm just a dry stick used by Jesus Christ. So there's a reason I pray that I may maintain the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And number three, I pray because only through prayer I can cast out devil. So many people, they come to church obsessed, oppressed, depressed, and possessed by devil. You know, they are living in the world, and the world is under the demonic power. And every day they are obsessed, oppressed, depressed, and possessed by devil. They come to church with depressed mind. And in my ministry, I not only preach, but I always bind devil and cast them out. Give them the spiritual shower, and they cleanse them. Then they become very happy and joyful. We are at war against the devil. And filthy spirit, evil spirit, spirit liar, spirit of divination, spirit infirmity, spirit of sicknesses. Hordes of these demon spirits are working, attacking the church and Christianity. So to, we must fight. My associate shows me the watch and says, stop preaching. But I'm leaving today after tomorrow, so why should I worry? If you like to leave, go. <laughs> Actually, today I came out to preach about tabernacle prayer, but God changed my message. Yes. So I'm just speaking freely as the Holy Spirit leads me right now. Yes. And Brother Kilpatrick, I also heard news in Korea that your church runs till the 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. So I don't worry about time. <laughs> And we must serious in church ministry. We must cast out devil. In America, you were born in Christian society. But Korean Orient is different. When you go into any city and town to start church, already there is Buddhism, Shintoism, Hinduism. All of demons come and 
took the places. And if you don't wrestle with them and cast the, the, those spirits out, you can't start your church. It's real wrestling. Real wrestling. I was uh, uh, pioneering my church first in the neighborhood of the, the slum area. When I put up tent, there was already a, the, 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 the demon worshiping temple there. And the, the leader came to me and said, we came ahead of you. We have preemptive right. If you don't move out, we'll burn up your tent. We'll kill you. But I said, Constitution of Korea assures me that I have every right to start my church here. But I said, no, we came ahead of you. And these people belong to us. You can start church here. So I began to pray. It's a, it's a, it's a fighting, spiritual wrestling. So I began to pray, and they began to cast the rock, and they scared me. Then one day, their team came to me and said, let's have contest. There's a woman down there in the town. She was paralytic for seven years. In that situation, she gave birth to her daughter, and she's dying in that condition. If you are God could raise her up in one month, you will have your church here. But from today, after one month, if you could not raise up that woman, you are out of this place. This is our uh, proposition. Are you ready to accept? No alternative, you know, in this situation. So I said, okay, I accept your proposition. So I went down with my mother-in-law to see her. She was really living in filthy places. She was sick, her husband was alcoholic, and the home was in terrible situation. And I tried to win her to Jesus Christ. She was adamant, she said, no. And we cleaned the home, we cooked the meal and brought to her, but she was adamant. And when we visited her home, then the, this, uh, this, the, this group from demon worshipers, they would come and encourage her, don't accept the past, don't compromise. Then when they leave, then we visit. And she was adamant. And so I was praying. We were fasting and praying. Oh, God, intervene. Break the power of Satan. Oh, God, we were praying. Then 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, and the last day came. And she was adamant. She was not accepting Jesus. But whether she was listening or not, I was preaching to her every day. Then when I come out, then these people come and encourage you not to accept Jesus. So that day I was desperate. And the last day I was praying all night in my study. I was praying. Then about 1 o'clock in the early morning, I fell into trance. And I began to hear the eerie oriental music. Then my door was flung open. And here, a big snake began to move according to the cadence of the oriental music. And the head was a beautiful woman. I've never seen such a beautiful woman in my life. And she was smiling and slithering me around and said, why do you stand against me? Let's live together with me. You will have a happy life. But I said, you're the animal. You're the snake. God never gave me permission to live with the snake. <laughs> and she began to smile. Then suddenly, that face turned into a very ugly Satan, very fearful face of Satan. And suddenly, jumped off me. I took hold of the neck, and I was trembling like this. And the, the, the snake was so powerful, it was coming nearer, nearer to me. I was totally paralyzed. In my mind, I couldn't speak. And the, the Satan opened mouth and tried to bite off my whole face. Then in my heart, in my thoughts, I said, Jesus. I could not open my mouth. I was paralyzed. I said, Jesus, Jesus. When I mentioned the name of Jesus, the fear appeared in the eyes of the Satan. Then I was strengthened. I could mention the name audi audibly, Jesus, Jesus. Then Satan became powerless. Finally, I pushed down the head, put my heel on the head, and smashed.
and the uh, eyes burst out and teeth came out. So I rolled up the snake on my hand and I went out my house and the whole town turned out standing at the yard. I said, you've been worshiping the snake all through these years. Now this snake is beaten. I cast the snake away and I woke up. I was full of the sweat. That was my vision. And we have early morning prayer meeting in Korea. So at 4.30, I went out to conduct early morning prayer meeting. In Korea, you know, spring, summer, and autumn, winter, ministers should go out to church at 4.30 to conduct early morning prayer meeting. If you miss, they think that you are a fallen angel. <laughs> it's not easy to become a pastor in Korea. <laughs> and so I went out and I conducted early morning prayer meeting. One of the sisters came to me and says, Pastor, it is over. They are coming up to church to burn up the church. Well, sure enough, I could not raise up last day, so this is end. And when I came out of my tent church, whole town turned out. They were marching toward our church. I said, oh God, I lost the battle. They are going to burn up this church. We are going to be chased out of this place. And one young lady, she was carrying a baby on her, in her bosom. She was leading the whole crowd, and they were following her. And when she came to her, I could not believe my eyes. She says, Pastor, I said, are you the twin girl of that paralyzed woman? She was exactly the same facial feature of that uh, paralytic. So are you the sister, twin sister? She says, no, I'm the paralytic. How come you walk? He says, Pastor, don't tease me. In the 2 a.m. last evening, you came to our yard, and you shouted to me, rise up and walk. And so I rose up. And I found out I was healed. And I took my baby and lifted up. She was healed. The suddenly power came to me. And I began to speak in strange language. <laughs> and she said, I went out to see you, but you were gone. I said, I didn't go to your house. No, you came. This is proof. You shouted to me to rise up. And I remembered that vision. I was having wrestling against the devil, and when the devil was beaten, she was healed. Yeah. You know? The whole town, almost whole town turned to Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the place where they had uh, their the idol worshiping house, the town gave that place to me, the beautiful mountain. And we established the Assemblies of God Church there, beautiful church. Without having wrestling against power in the air, you can't win soul. There's reason you should pray. You know, I have had a very, very queer experience. I was uh, working in Japan for more than 10 years. I was preaching from town to town, city to cities. And those leaders, they would not accept Jesus. They were confused. They, in Japan, eight, they have 8 million God. So when you say Jesus, is who is Jesus? This is one of the God out of eight million? So, the same, same God. But I chartered the airplane. I paid all the expense. I took them all to Korea. And one by one, they gave her to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a two hour flight difference. So I said, I preached so hard to you in Japan but you did not give your heart to Jesus. But how come that you come to Korea and you give heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? They said, in Japan, we couldn't understand your language. We were so confused. We couldn't understand. But uh, when, I, when we come to Korea, it's so clear. We understand. Because in Japan, the power in the air is so powerful. Japanese church is so weak. 
out of 120 million Japanese population, they are less than one million Christian. So they are very weak and uh, devilish in control. But in Korea, 12 million Christians are praying every day. Power and air is broken. We have spiritual clean air. We don't have a spiritual pollution there. One American chaplain moved from Germany to South Korea, and he built the largest army chapel in downtown city. He would come on uh, Friday night and preach to our Christian often, and he said, Brother Joe, I can understand. I am same chaplain who preached in Germany, transferred to Korea. I preached the same message in Germany so hard, but nothing happened. Very few people come to Jesus. But I come to Korea and I preach the same message and hundreds of soldiers and thousands of them come to the chapel. They get saved. He says, how come? I say, it's very easy to explain. German people, they don't pray. So power in the air give com spirit confusion to the people and to the mind of the American soldier. So, strong that they can't accept Jesus. But when you come to Korea, you American, you, may, you, you are not praying very much, but you get the benefit of the Korean prayer. <laughs> you are under the Korean heaven. And the power in heaven is broken. So the power of the Holy Spirit freely work. There's reason you have more souls saved here. Without prayer, you can't break the power which grip the souls of people. In America, you don't see the heathen temple, but still, there is power in the air. You have a spiritual warfare, and only through prayer you can break the spiritual power. When I was pioneering, we had a once great victory. I led one woman to Jesus Christ. She was the wife of a famous physician, and she was also a graduate of the Tokyo Pharmaceutical School, very intelligent, but she was paralyzed on her side, and she was pulling her body like this. So we led her to Jesus Christ, and she was coming to church. And one day, in the evening, she was praying in the church, but she suddenly began to laugh in a very eerie way. And it's chilling. And I was so frightened. But sure enough, she came to my study, and she says, Pastor, what's happened to me? I tried to pray, but some strange power rise up, and I began to laugh, and the goosebump rise up all over my body. I'm scared and frightened. What is this? And that time, I was ignorant about the work of Satan, and I said, Sister, you must be very tired. Go home and rest, and don't come to the early morning prayer meeting. She looked at me. You always ask us to come to the early morning prayer meeting and prayer meeting in the evening. Now you ask me not to come to the prayer meeting. I said, why do you do that? I said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm scared of your situation. I don't know what's happened to you. So your husband is a doctor, and he would put all the blame on me. So don't come to church. And she left. I said, Lord. Please don't send her back to Jesus, to our church. I'm afraid. I don't know how to handle her. If anything happened, her, hus her husband would put all the blame on me, and I will lose my ministry here. So I prayed that so God move upon her heart so that she will not come to church anymore. <laughs> I prayed for her to come to church. Now I pray for her not to come to church. And that early morning prayer meeting when I went out, sure enough, she was sitting in that corner. I said, oh, God, please keep her quiet. I read scripture, and I stood up to preach. Then she rose up, and she began to laugh in queuing. And all the people, one by one, stood up, and they left the church. And she was left alone with me. It was a hot summer day. So I went to her. I said, lady, you can't act like that in the church. You should not laugh like that. And she looked at me. She said, today, I'm going to kill you. I said, you are the lady. The lady is not supposed to speak like that to the pastor. <laughs> and she took her fist and knocked on my chest, and I fell back there. I said, lady, you are beating the pastor. <laughs> I 
Then the guttural sound came out of her mouth. We are many. Yes, we are going to kill you, kill this woman today. She's been living with me together more than 10 years. But since coming to church, she would not talk with me. She would only try to talk with Jesus. So we are going to destroy her. And so I said, who are you? He said, we are the devil. I said, you are kidding. <laughs> then suddenly she said, we are many. We are going to overcome you. And she began to follow me like that, to hit me. And I was going around, and she was following me around. And I was so frightened. I said, Jesus, cover me with the blood of Jesus. Jesus, cover me with the blood. Then suddenly, the scripture dawned upon me. Ye shall cast a devil in my name. So I stopped. I turned around. I said, you devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, you come out. And the devil laughed, and the devil said, you are green bean. We are not scared. We are going to destroy you. And that was right. I was green bean, fresh out of Bible college. <laughs> and two of my deacons came. I said, come and help me. So two of deacons came and joined hand with me and began to pray. And this woman began to dig all the sins of that two men. As you committed this adultery at such and such a place, and you stole things in such and such a place, Soon these two men left that place and went to the platform and they were confessing sin, hearing the message from the <laughs> Satan. <laughs> then after a little while, these two guys tried to join with me and they laughed and said, you confessed because you heard my message, so you are my disciple. Today, we are going to kill you together. And both of them said, Pastor, we are busy. Um, we are sorry. Goodbye. And they left. <laughs> and I was left alone with them. So, oh, we were fighting. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. They said, no, we are not coming out. He says, they said, you, you don't know about faith. You are only quoting the scripture. We are not afraid. And I quoted all the scripture, but still the devil was standing against me. Hot summer day, and... We didn't eat anything, nor drink anything, whole day long. We've been fighting for eight hours. And evening was falling, and I was frightened, because her husband surely would come to seek uh, his wife. And finding out that kind of situation, he would put all the blame on me. So I become desperate, but we were so exhausted now. So I, come, I say to the devil, devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. And devil is so tired, too. No, we are not coming. Out. <laughs> you know, many people have misunderstanding. They think the devil would leave easily. No way. They fight to the last moment. Last month, there's a reason you need a very persistent prayer. The devil will not be easily kicked out. So I was so exhausted with all the strength. I said, you devil, come out. And they went, no, we are not coming out. <laughs> and we were fighting like that. And finally, I become desperate. I said, Jesus, now I'm desperate. You must help me. I've been fighting for eight hours, and this guy will not leave. And he's tired, and I'm tired. <laughs> we can't continue like this. Then suddenly the power of God came upon me. I become so refreshed. I become so strength, strengthened. I could stand on my toe like a ballerina. <laughs> and I tell you, really, the, the whole wind of power came. And my eyes began to go up like a Chinese.
We, we Korean, uh, Mongolian, we are not Chinese. <laughs> so when I went over her, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you devil come out! And devil opened the mouth. And she began to vomit and twist, and devil began to come out. And after a little while, she slumped down. She stopped breathing. She seemed to be dead. I said, God, this is worse than demon possession. <laughs> I said, Father, she's dead. She's dead now. What can I do? Resurrect her in the name of Jesus Christ. Resurrect her in the name of Jesus. Then after a little while, she opened her eyes and she breathed deeply and she said, Pastor, I'm sorry. All while, while you were fighting each other, I was listening. I was so bound by devil, I could not do anything, but I was listening. And devil were talking the tactics among themselves. First, they said, this is young guy. He does not know anything about our power. He only quote the scripture, but he really do not believe in scripture. He is scared. So when we persist, he will be beaten. But you continued and continued. Then the devil said, oh, this guy is persistent. So we should be persistent also. Then when you pray to Jesus and when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon you, the demon among themselves said, oh, Jesus helps him. The power of the Holy Spirit upon him. We can't stand any longer. Then the devil said, let's make order. You go first. I'll follow you second. And I'll follow you third. They were making the order. Then when you commanded, one by one, breaking my whole body, went out of my body. This is so painful, but one by one, they left. I'm free. So I said, I'm so happy. You go back home quickly before your husband arrive home, go quickly. <laughs> and she left, and after a little while, she began to shout again, oh, and she rushed back to church. I said, all over again, oh God, <laughs> all over. But this time, she was different. She was jumping all over the place. She says, I'm healed, I'm healed, look at me. She says, I'm healed. <laughs> she was completely healed. So her husband came next Sunday, escorting her to church. He said, this must be a miracle, because since getting married her, I've tried the best doctors and best medicine in the world to cure her. But I could not cure her. She had a very strange sickness in brain and vertebra. But I don't know what's happened, but she come to this tent church, and she is whole. She's healed. She says, this is from the Lord. So he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we came out to the second church, Dr. John Hurston and me, every Tuesday we sat down and we were praying for deliverance. Do you remember, John? Yeah, whole day we were in office and praying. And we have very, very clear experience. One of our uh, workers in the church, uh, he was cleaning the church. While my mother and I were visiting, we, I found out that he was on the street feeding. Uh, he was having a lunatic. I mean, he was feeding in the street. And he, he smashed his neck and bleeding. So we took him to church and cleansed him, and we gave him a job in the church. But he was causing a lot of trouble. During the service, he feeding in shout and disturbing the service. So I determined to deal with this devil. So after early morning prayer meeting, I called him to office and I began to pray for him. He was sitting before me, I pray. I pray for three hours and no response, nothing. So a thought came to my mind, oh, this feeding must come by his brain damage instead of devil. So I started praying the last one more prayer then I would stop praying because if this is from brain damage, then I should not cast out devil. I should rather ask God to heal the brain damage. So I prayed the last prayer. Then suddenly the demon spoke up. He said, 
We don't like to leave this body. So, oh, you are the devil. You are not brain damaged. <laughs> you know, demon persist. And so I said, now I find out that you are the devil, you must come out. And devil said, let's have a dealing. He said to me, do you love Jesus? Uh, surely. And Jesus loves people, doesn't he? Yes, Jesus loves people. Christian is love, isn't it? Yes, it is. Why don't you love us? We are the demon spirit. That's right. But you are supposed to love us. I said, oh, you devil. You can't cheat me. Jesus said, love human beings, not devil. Jesus said, cast out devil. Then the devil said, you listen to us. We are spiritual beings. We see every day that Christians die and escorted by angel to heaven. The door of heaven is open and we see the golden street and how the angel escort Christians to the eternal kingdom. We are spiritual beings. We are watching them. And we, we feel miserable. Yes, we, we can't go there. We are going to an eternal hell. And so why aren't you be a little bit merciful so that we may stay in this body? We are peaceful and happy in this body. But when we leave this body, we are painful, painful. So anyway, you Christians, you are going to enjoy a wonderful, wonderful life in that kingdom of heaven. But we are not. So please let us stay here. A, some, a little longer. I said, no way. You are not supposed to stay in the temple of the Holy Ghost. You must go. And I commanded very powerfully. Then the boy fell out of the chair. And he fell into deep slumber. And he woke up. He was completely delivered. So, we are at war against the demon power. And we must win the spiritual warfare. There's reason you should pray. You do never think that devil would leave you in a moment. Devil is persistent, very persistent. When I was having a continual meeting in Japan, one Sunday afternoon with my business people, I left Seoul and we went to in Osaka and checked into hotel and we were very tired. So I, I, I slept early hour because from next day we were starting the campaign. In the middle of night, I woke up and the room was so chilly. I felt something gooey things in the church, in, 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 in the room. I was so frightened. My heart was jumping and my, my hairs were all standing up. Those days I had more hair than right now. <laughs> my hairs were all standing up. And I, I jumped and I sat. And I saw something sitting on the edge of my, my, my bed. I really saw that spiritual being. And then spiritual being began to speak to me. Ah. You begin to come to church and try to harass my people. You are disturbing my kingdom. And I've been following you. And I've already killed one of your business person, one of my business people killed while he was escorting me. And today, I'm going to kill you. I've caught you, and you are going to have a heart attack. My heart was palpitating so fast, I felt as if the heart was going to come out of my mouth. <gasps> I could hard breathe. And the devil was tremendously positive in his negative attack. Yes, you, you know, the devil was not saying that you may be killed. The devil said, you are killed today. I've caught you. You are going to have a heart attack today. So I said, no, I'm not going to have a heart attack. But I was feeling chill all over my body. Goosebumps rise up all over my body. I was trembling. I was so scared. I wanted to rise up and run away. I want to say, help me to my uh, uh, business people who are living next door. But uh, someone spoke in my heart, if you run before the devil, you will never come back to Japan anymore. You will sit down and pray. And I prayed. And I was so happy at that time because uh, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
I could not speak in Korean language. I was so paralyzed by the power of devil. But I spoke in other tongues. I spoke in other tongues and the fire was burning in my heart and chilly feeling pour out me. Outside I was frozen, inside I was burning. So I was fighting and I was praying and praying and praying. I said, you devil, you go. And devil said, no, we don't go. You can rob my people in Japan. No, we can't go. But I was fighting and fighting and fighting. And then finally the Holy Spirit said, quote scripture, don't just uh, pray the, in plain language, quote the scripture. So I began to quote scripture. It is written, ye shall cast a devil in my name. I said, is this written in scripture, the resist devil and devil shall flee. And the devil said, oh, you start to quote the scripture. Yes, I said, yes, yes, this is sword of spirit. You can stand before me. And after several hours, I was completely soaked with perspiration. And instantly, suddenly, the devil said, okay, today I leave, but I'll come again. <laughs> Left. From that time, I began to great harvest in Japan. When I first went in Japan in 1979, every Japanese church had 15 to 30 members. And after having my ministry in Japan for 10 years through radio, television, through the publication and through the evangelist campaign, and I've been constantly training the Japanese ministers and help them start the cell system. Now, in Japan, every church is Five, uh, 100 to 500 church is growing and uh, since that battle I began to have much bigger meeting much greater harvest of soul in Japan you know even in America and other part of the world the demon devil in the heavenly places organization and appointed all the demon spirit over the countries and cities so if you don't defeat them by prayer, you can't have victory. Do you know why God gives great revival here in Pensacola? I think uh, in the Pensacola, this church was praying and break the power in the heaven. So God could freely send the power of the Holy Spirit upon this church. So through prayer, you can bind the devil, you can release the power of the Holy Spirit, this reason I pray. If I don't pray, soon the power of the devil will come and, and, and disturb our church. And number four, I pray because through prayer, God intervened in human affairs. In 1987, we were having a presidential election. But all university students rose up and they were making demonstration and labor. Unrest was terrible in our country. Communism seemed to be overtaking our country. Then one day, prime minister invited me to his home uh, uh, to dinner. And when I went to his home, he was trembling. He says, Pastor, I can handle this uh, demonstration. This with the uh, police power, I can handle, I can mobilize military power. We can't have the presidential election. We are in terrible situation. And I'm at loss as to what to do. Pastor, you help me. So I said, okay, I'll help you. I said, all of behind this, behind this demonstration, there's evil power, which is how to destroy Korea and Korean churches. We should uh, deal this evil power behind the first. You can solve this, plan, this problem by political scheme. So I came to church and I began to organize a massive prayer meeting. I want to gather together 600,000 people in the plaza to pray. So I announced that in a month we'll have this big prayer meeting and we started to prepare. Then communists, they sent me a notification. They said we will kill all whole family. And so I was so frightened, I sent my wife and children all to America. They, I, I sent them to New York. And I could not leave my church. I was surrounded by my deacons. And I was living in my office and I was praying. And I was uh, supposed to conduct that big meeting with my best friend, the Baptist, Billy Kim. And when the last day came, he was so 
scared, he left Korea and went to America. And on the last day, he called me by telephone. He said, Cho, I have a big campaign here, and I can't come to Korea. I said, Billy, you believe that you can live by leaving Korea and go to America? I said, I'll accuse you to Jesus Christ. You are leaving me alone, and you try to leave Korea to save your life. I said, you are cowardice. You must come back. But he said, I have a big campaign here. As campaign or no campaign, you made promise to stand with me together. You must come. Then, on Saturday, I called my parents. I said, Daddy, Mama, today I may go home. Because the sniper would shoot at me at any place. So if I go ahead, don't feel sorry. I go to heaven for the sake of Jesus Christ. And that day I went out to the plaza and 600,000 people gathered together. And oh, we prayed for our country. We interceded for our country all day long under the hot sun. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Then in the afternoon, at the time of the dismissal of the meeting, the Spirit said, make a parade through the city. So I said, we are going to make parade through the town. Very dangerous. Snipers can be in any building and shoot at me. But God said, you stand in front and go. So I said, we are going to have parade. Then city police came and says, you are going to blockade the whole traffic and cause a chaos in the city. If you try to make parade without getting permission, we will put in you in jail. I said, all right put us all together in jail, 600,000 people. <laughs> you don't have jail big enough to put us all in jail. We are parading. So we paraded. Then the students sent me notification. We, 3,000 of us are waiting here. We will destroy you. And so I said, okay, come. We, 600,000 of us are going to trample upon you. Come. And no one came. They were scared by the vast crowd of Christians. We were carrying all the slogans and banners and all the television and live shows and radio and newspaper. And we were parading through the town shouting, Jesus Christ. And next day, all things has settled down and very calm. We had a wonderful election without having any trouble. Then 1988, we had Summer Olympic. And again, those things erupted. Then that time, I mobilized 700,000 people in the plaza, and we prayed again, interceded. Then we had wonderful, we had wonderful Summer Olympic. Through prayer, you can change your whole nation. You can change your politics. You can change your whole nation. There's a reason you should pray. Prayer. Bring God on the scene. God can only intervene in your personal affair through your prayer. And only through prayer you can touch others. The trouble right now in Christianity is a lack of sanctification. We have beautiful building, wonderful pastors, wonderful music and everything. But we lack the sanctification. Too much of the world came into the church. And especially leaders, they are compromising with the world too much. And the only way to be cleansed by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, is through prayer. By confessing our sin every day. Every day when I pray, I pray according to the tabernacle prayer. This is very powerful prayer. And I, I always uh, first come to tabernacle and I come to the brazen altar, which is analogous to the Calvary. There I see Jesus and I praise the blood of Jesus Christ. I wash the blood as Jesus through the blood. You cleansed our sin eternally through the cloud of blood. You made me righteous, so I worship the blood. Then I worship blood which brought us near to God and, and 
and reconcile us to Heavenly Father. I praise the blood which brings healing. I praise the blood for the, the, the redemption from the curse, and I praise the blood which conquered death and hell. So I start my prayer every day, worshiping the blood, looking to the cross, the brazen altar. I see my sacrifice, Jesus, sin offering, and uh, trespass offering, and uh, peace offering, and burnt offering, my Jesus. And I worship him, I offer him, and I soak myself with the blood. Then when I go to the labor, labor is made out of the uh, bronze mirror. They beat the front mirror and made the, the, the water basin. So priest wash hand and face there before entering the holy place. So they reflect themselves before the, the water basin. And when I go there, every morning I confess my sin. I reflect myself according to the Ten Commandment, according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. I say, dear Jesus, please forgive my unrighteousness. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. And you know, I have deep settled sin and I try to cleanse myself from the sin every day. That is a sin of exaggeration. You know, I'm pastor and I try to picture beautifully so that people could understand things really. That is my temptation. And so I say always, always my wife after preaching, she said, you exaggerate. Your number is exaggerated. Your story is exaggerated. And many times I got angry. I said, you go to pulpit and preach. <laughs> but she says, I'm telling the truth. So every day I confess my sin. I says, God, let me not tell a lie. This world is full of lies, and I'm telling too much a lie. And I'm exaggerating too much. So please, please, oh God, forgive me. And now I'm far less exaggerating than before. <laughs> because I'm confessing my sin every day. I stand before the labor and I confess my sin of the, the, the telling the lie and exaggeration. Then I say, oh God, help me to totally allegiance to you. You are my Lord and you are hired servant. Let me just obey you. Then I always pray, oh God, make me sanctified. I may build a big church, I may organize a wonderful church, but if I lose sanctification, all the foundation is broken and destroyed. Brothers and sisters, nowadays we have wonderful preachers, wonderful church, but they lose ministry instantly because of lack of the foundation, the sanctification. When we lose sanctification, we lose everything. So every day we should pray. There are no perfect person at all. And I'm praying every day. I say, God, protect me, cleanse me, sanctify me. In my mind, I'm now 63 years old. When I was younger, I was far more tempted. But now I'm less tempted because I'm getting older. I'm thinking about that. But still, I get temptation constantly in my mind. They will attack me, honestly. I'm always saying to my people, pray for me. I'm being tempted. And I say to my people, you young ladies, don't tempt me. I'm very weak. I'm very weak. I'm very weak. I say, I always confess to you. I say, I'm very weak. I'm not a strong man. I need your help. Don't tempt me. You know, many of them, they are writing me, writing me a love letter. And uh, they, are, they are trying to tempt me. When you have 700,000 people, they, you have many queer people there too. <laughs> so, I open up myself. I said, don't take your past as a super spiritual person. I'm very weak. When you tempt, I have danger of falling into temptation. So don't tempt me, you protect me. I protect you, you protect me. So, I never travel alone. Many people accuse me because I'm using chauffeur. I, use, I have driver's license, but I use my chauffeur so that my chauffeur could watch me. You know, wherever I go, my chauffeur drive me, so my chauffeur watch me. And I ask my wife to hire my chauffeur.
He report everything to my wife where I went, you know, to protect myself. And when I travel in our country, outside the country, I go together with the dozens of business people. We are checking together in hotel. We are leaving hotel together to protect me. Well, they become a hindrance to me, but still they become protection to me. <laughs> because since you are minister, I open my heart honestly to the lay Christian. I don't speak like this. But we are the ministers. We have holy calling, and we must protect ourselves. And uh, we are not Gibraltar. We are not strong. We are very weak vessel. So we should make all the arrangements to protect ourselves so that temptation will not destroy our life and ministry. Yeah. So every day, every day we should ask God to sanctify us. And we should say, oh God, do not lead us into temptation and deliver us from the devil. Every day we should pray. We are very weak vessel. Then I ask God to cleanse me from the greed, from the avarice. When greed comes into me, then I would commit sin. Since I have the largest church in the world and we have abundance finance, our every year income amount to $150 million US. So we have good amount of the fund. And I have temptation. I want to have the best car. And all of my elders, you know, they try to tempt me. They say, you are a very important person. You should have the best car. And they say, you must live in the best home. And you must have a best life. Well, I think I'm entitled to. I've been in ministry for 40 years. I've suffered very much all these years. But still, I'm not using my privilege because if I start to do that, then unbelieving mass media would attack me. He said, look at his uh, personal life. And then I bring a shame upon Christianity. There's reason I'm not using my privilege because I'm afraid. This unbelieving world is always watching at me and ready to attack me. And so I say, oh God, deliver me from the greed. Please deliver me from greed. You know, I really enjoy good clothes, good shoes, good food, and a good house. I'm born with that desire. But praise the Lord, my wife is not born with that desire. So she is always uh, uh, constrained me not to go into that direction. And so far I've been kept. So I'm praying every day, God, deliver me from the greed. Then also I pray that God deliver me from hatred. You know, when you have 1,000 elders and 50,000 deacons, many of them become a thorn in your flesh. And I don't like to hate them, but I hate them. You know, I hate many elders, and I hate many deacons. They cause such a trouble. So every day I should ask God to forgive me, as God help me not to hate. Oh God, heal the spirit of hate. Give me a love. Give me a forgiving spirit. This is my trouble. I'm not saint. I'm struggling with people. And so far, God has helped me. Forgiveness has a tremendous power. One sister came to me. She was twitching her face. She was facial uh, the, the, the paralysis. And she tried all the medicine, Chinese acupuncture, but she was not healed. I, I prayed for her many times, but she still was twitching, and she was a beautiful woman, but she messed up because of this paralysis. And one day she was crying, she said, I want to commit suicide. She says, I can't see myself in the mirror. And I was powerless. I laid hand on her and prayed many times, and nothing happened. Then the Holy Spirit said, ask her if she hate anybody. So I said, sister, do you hate anybody? She says, yes. I says, whom do you hate? In laws. She says, we have big family. In the Orient, sometimes we have big family. She says, I live with father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and their family together. 
I work like a slave for my family, but they don't appreciate me. And they criticize me. So I hate my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law. I hate them. But I say, if you hate them, God will not answer to your prayer. You should love them. She cried. Pastor, I can't love them. If you were in my shoes, you would hate them also. He says, they don't appreciate me. I hate them. So I said, then I can't help you. Then the spirit checked me, the spirit. I said, why don't you counsel her according to the scripture? I said, I counsel with the scripture. Where does Bible say that she should love her family before she got answer? My Bible says that forgive, not love. Forgive. Then your heavenly father shall forgive. So I said, sister, this is the teaching of scripture. Forgive before you pray. Then Heavenly Father will forgive you. Can you forgive? She said, I can forgive. Okay. After forgiving, if you have some leftover power, then start love. <laughs> if you have no power left to love after forgiving, you're okay. So let's forgive. So we began to name the father, mother-in-law, and brother and sister-in-law. And she was uh, uh, naming, and she was confessing, and I was praying for her. And I opened my eyes to see what's go going to happen. And right in front of my eyes, her paralysis was, paralysis was disappearing. She was, uh, she was confessing the hatred, and she was confessing that, and healing power came, and twitching stopped, and she was healed. And as soon as I saw that, I right away knelt down. I said, oh, God, I forgive the elders. I forgive the deacons. I forgive the deaconess. <laughs> what a spiritual revival I felt. What a spiritual revival. Now I see that many people are not healed because they hate their sibling. Many people hate their father, mother, brothers, and sisters, and neighbors. And that hatred stopped the flowing of the healing power. And since finding out that I helped so many unhealed people to be healed by helping them to confess their hatred. So I pray, oh God, help me to love. I should every day confess because uh, every day I get delivered. Then I fall into the trap again and again because I should deal with them personally. Then I say, oh God, make me meek and humble. Because when I come see people, my people, they come to my office to have counseling. When I see their hand, their hand tremble. They think me as a giant of the, uh, the, the God's kingdom, something like a holy person. They are frightened about me. So when they come to have personal counseling, when I see they are trembling like this. So I said, oh God, I should never act ugly. I should be humble and meek so that nobody would feel intimidated in my presence. So I confess all of those kinds of things. Then I name the Ten Commandments one by one and mirror me there and I confess my sin. So every day I have tabernacle prayer. When I pray, I praise the blood of Jesus Christ, I praise an altar. Then I come to labor and I confess all of my sin and I ask God to sanctify me Sanctification is the foundation of my ministry. And if I lose my sanctification, next morning I lose my whole church, my whole ministry. Presently in Korea, one of the Korean Christian leader, he is a Methodist, powerful person. When he was going to Bible college, he would attend my church and I pray for him. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I said in Methodism, if you preach Pentecostal message, you will have the largest Methodist church in the world. And he has now 80,000 members. And he's building a church which is larger than my church. And I'm happy about it. But he fell this time. He fell this time. And I'm believing mass media took it up and television broadcast it all over our country. Oh, it's a miserable situation. And, and, and he's losing his ministry, he's losing his church, he's losing his, his Christians. He was uh, such a bright light. 
He was a shining star. But one morning, he lost his foundation. Now I'm trying to restore him. But I even myself feel miserable. Because when I try to restore him, unbelievers, they attack me also. They say I should never, never restore him. He should die. But I love him so much. He's a wonderful preacher, powerful preacher. But now he lost his ministry. He built this ministry for 20 years. But he lost this ministry one morning by losing the sanctification. Just because of one woman, he's losing the whole ministry. So, sanctification is very important. Brothers and sisters, we are the ministers. We are being attacked by Satan. We are fighting in front of battle. And many people get shot at in the, in, in the war. And so we are in the, in the battle. We are going to be shot at. So, sanctification is very necessary. Very necessary. I can't stress upon this things too, too much and too strong because uh, so many ministers under me, 3,000 ministers went out of my church. And so many of them fall in their ministry when they have about 1,000 people, 3,000 people, usually they fall and they lose whole foundation. I've seen over and over again through my 40 years of ministry. So we should watch out. Then I jog into the holy place. And when I see on the left side, I see the golden candlestick. This is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Then I go there and kneel down. And I, I really worship the Holy Spirit. I say, dear Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom. Impart me your wisdom. You are spirit of understanding, give me the understanding. You are spirit of counseling, give me good counseling. You are the spirit of power, give me the power of the Holy Spirit. You are the spirit of, of the fear of the Lord, put the fear of the Lord in my heart. You are spirit of the Holy God, give me the holy sanctification to me. Dear Holy Spirit, I worship you. You know, it is one thing to be born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and full of Holy Spirit and speaking other tongues. By this, another thing to have a personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He's a real person. So you must have a daily personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In 1964, God revealed that truth to me. Up until that time, I was satisfied with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but God said, he is a Holy person, you must have a very definite fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He says, this is the hour of the Holy Spirit. So you must have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And from that time until now, whenever I go to pulpit to speak, I always say, dear Holy Spirit, let's go. Even today, I said, dear Holy Spirit, let's go. Then the Holy Spirit said, change your message. If I preached my own message, I would have finished a long time ago. <laughs> so I always say, dear Holy Spirit, when I come to pray before the golden candlestick, I recognize you. I welcome you. I, I worship you. I thank you. Let's go together today. Let's go. And when I finish my sermon, I sit down, I say, Dear Holy Spirit, I really thank you. I messed up, but you corrected everything. I really thank you. The Holy Spirit, I have fellowship. How do you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit? You must talk to each other. If you don't talk, you can't have fellowship. Once I was lecturing uh, to the Billy Graham's team and one Baptist pastor. He says, Cho, stop, stop. I see the red light. You cannot talk to the Holy Spirit. So I said, brother, 
Father, God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. It's, uh, and we, we are all family members. We are family members. We talk to each other freely. We not only talk to father, but we talk to the mother and son and children. You know, if you neglect the Holy Spirit, he is going to be quenched. So he's a person. Person need to be praised, loved, and encouraged. I got married when I was 29 years old. But at that time, I wanted to become a Billy Graham of Korea. So I would leave my wife in the apartment. Monday, I leave for evangelistic field. And Saturday, I come with a lot of laundry. After Sunday service, then I would leave again. Korean women, they are, they are very, what shall I say, obedient to the husband. This oriental custom. Now they are changed because of American television. <laughs> And uh, she would cook a delicious meal and uh, fill the, 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 the wash tub with the warm water. And she was doing everything for me. Then after a little while, she was depressed. She was crying. And one day, my mother-in-law came to me and said, son, I want to talk with you. She said, your wife is going to leave you. He said, how come? She said, you didn't bring a thing to your home. You brought a person to your home and you are a neglecting person, and her spirit is quenched, and she's going to leave you. I said, oh, mother, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So I went home. I called my wife and said, you are a grown-up woman. You are married to me. You married a preacher. When you have trouble, you are not supposed to go to your mother-in-law. You are your mother, like a baby. You must talk with me. You are full of devil. I, I can solve this problem. So I laid a hand on her. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you whining devil, come out. You whining devil, go out. And I said, problem solved. <laughs> but brother and sister, it's got worse. She was really depressed now. And she would not even rise up in the morning. And I was in terrible situation. So I really begin to pray, God, I want to become a Korean Billy Graham, and I need to go out to the evangelistic field. And she's becoming a hindrance. You must help me to solve this problem. Then God spoke to my heart. I don't need any other Billy Graham anymore. <laughs> you are Cho. You are not Billy Graham. Be a Cho. Don't imitate Billy Graham. I didn't call you as evangelist. I called you as a pastor. Very definite. Then God said, don't neglect your wife. Listen to her. You may build a good church, tremendous church. You may become a tremendous evangelist. But if you get divorced, you lose everything next morning. You lose everything. So God said, do this way. In my heart, the spirit of the Lord revealing is God's God first, you second, and your wife third, and your children fourth, your church fifth. I said, no way. This is spirit from America, not from Korea. <laughs> I said, I can't accept that. I said, I said, God first, church second, and me third, children fourth. My wife fifths. And God said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, God first, then if you don't take good care of God's servant, you can't serve unto the Lord. Take good care of yourself. Then your wife, then your children, then your church. I really had struggle in my mind. I could not accept that. But finally, I settled down. So I went to my wife. I said, every Monday, I give my time to you. You do anything you like with me. So every Monday, she would pack up sandwich. And she wanted me to go to the park and walk miles and miles, hand in hand together. 
it was no easy thing at all. Because my mind was in evangelistic field, and she is talking and talking and talking. And then always she wants to confirm about, do you hear what I say? What did I say? What? What did you say? <laughs> oh, brother, I had a first fellowship with her. Then she would go to the window shopping. And my backbone was broken. I said, I'll give you money, pick up anything. She said, I enjoy window shopping. Today you gave whole day to me. So you must window shop together with me. <laughs> month after month, I had a forced fellowship. She was restored. She restored her health. I found one thing, that she was person, not a thing. Person need to be cared, loved, adored, and fellowshiped. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is a person. He is not a thing. He has been with you since you were saved. You must adore him. You must thank him, recognize him. Nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm 63 and my wife is 57. And she's uh, pleasantly prompt. <laughs> and uh, don't send this tape to my wife. <laughs> but every day, every day I say, honey, you look so wonderful. You are so beautiful. Some, some are true, some are Lie. <laughs> but I tell you, brothers and sisters, she is a person. I should build her personality and her pride. And so I've been living with her for 33 years. I have gained more wisdom now. And I don't know in America, but in Orient, women, when they get older, they become lioness, very strong and powerful. In, in Orient, women carry all the money. When we make money, we should give all the money to the woman, wife. I've never seen my salary envelope yet, because it directly goes to my wife. That is reason Korean church has a lot of money, because we have more women than men in church, and women more easily listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. And they save money and give more money to church. Men are stingy, so they don't give too much money to the Lord. So, women, in Korea, women have money, I tell you. Husband, they make money and give all women, and every day, husband should beg money from women. <laughs> I should always beg my wife, I said, honey, today I need $20. She says, where are you going to spend $20? You see, I, sh I should eat the lunch, I should meet my friend, and I should go to swimming pool, and so you must give me $20. She says, just spend $15. Oh, no, please, please give me. This is Korea. And when I came to Europe and America and told this story, they said, oh, that's heretic. We are not doing that. When we make money, that's our money. But in Korea, I wish those days would come sooner. <laughs> so when I have special income, I should hide that special income in some place. So always, always, I should encourage and recognize and, 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 and praise my wife. She's a person. And men also need praise from the wives. You, you wives of the ministers, you please give a 
abundant praise to your husband, his preaching. You know, when I preach in my church, after the service, I feel so empty. I feel as if I were run up red. I become so tired, so empty. I need praise. So when I come back home, I follow after my wife from the living room to the kitchen, expecting some praise about my sermon. <laughs> but for a long time, she has been so stingy. She will not praise me at all. And so finally, I, s I, I sat down with her. I said, honey, I need your praise. Honestly, I feel so tired, so empty. I don't even feel like preaching next week. I preached everything. I have no material. I need your encouragement. I need some of your praise. She looked at me and said, you are becoming arrogant now. <laughs> she said, so many people are praising you. And why should I praise you? I said, honey, praises from other people are like a chewing gum. I should chew and spit. If I drink, that stick into my stomach and cause trouble. When you praise me, I eat. That become nutrition to my spirit. When, when other people praise, that is a chewing gum. You should never eat it, spit it out. You must praise for me. In other words, I can't stand this stress. I feel so empty. So she laughed. From that time on, she really praised me. Oh, you preached a wonderful message. <laughs> wonderful message. <laughs> and I know that I forced her to praise me, but still I enjoy her praise. <laughs> so you ladies, I really pray with you. Praise your husband. They need your praise. They need your encouragement. Nobody can give that praise to your husband. So, we are all person. We are created according to the God's image and likeness. And God needs praise. Don't we praise God always? God needs praise. Always. We also need praise because we are in God's image and likeness. So praise your wife. Praise your husband. Build them each other. And the Holy Spirit is a person. So we always should say, when we come, when we pray the prayer of tabernacle, you come to the golden candlestick, you say, Dear Holy Spirit, I recognize you, I welcome you, I thank you, I adore you. You have been always working through me. I thank you very much, dear Holy Spirit. Let's go together. Let's go. When I started to recognize the Holy Spirit, I started to feel the, another dimension of power falling upon my ministry. So you must have fellowship and you should have partnership with the Holy Spirit. He is a senior partner, you are the junior. He is the Lord of the harvest. You are the, his hired servant. So always, always discuss with the Holy Spirit. Before Spirit speak, don't move. You know, work of the Holy Spirit is, 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 is activity. You are in the place of receptivity. Our role is not activity. We are in the place of receptivity. The Holy Spirit acts and we receive. So do never go ahead of the Holy Spirit. Wait upon the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't speak, just wait. When he speaks, then move. So you should have a fellowship and partnership with the Holy Spirit. There I worship the Holy Spirit in my prayer very much. Then when I look at the far right corner, there I see the showbread. Showbread is the word of Jesus Christ. I say, oh, Lord, I thank you this bread. I thank you the word of God. I thank you the Logos because I receive all the information about God and kingdom of God through Bible. But God, please give me the rhema every day. Rhema is a word of God for the specific person at the specific time. And if we... By studying the Logos, we give the information about the kingdom of God to the people. But by Rhema, they gain faith. Faith comes by hearing. So if you don't preach Rhema, people do not catch faith to hold, to, to solve the problem. There's reason my, I'm desperate to receive Rhema from the Lord. Wednesday, I have a Bible study. But Sunday, 
I've got to have word of God directly from him. Not written word, but spoken word. I want to hear his word. I go into prayer, prayer grotto and I wait before the Lord. God, speak out of the Bible. Speak through the Holy Spirit. I should have a spoken word instead of written word. Then when I make message out of the, that's a rhema, then I can really impart the faith into the heart of people. They receive the word, they believe, and they are encouraged. And God gave me a rhema whenever I pray for the healing. I had one of the greatest miracles one day in my life. A woman was terribly suffering. She was sitting right in front of the seat, and those people were helping her. She was suffering during service. And I didn't know what happened. Later, I found out that uh, she was pregnant and the baby died. And she, uh, the baby was decaying in the womb. So doctor said if she would not op be operated right away, then the poison would uh, uh, destroy the mother. But uh, our cell leader brought her to the church. And while she was listening to my sermon, she was dying there. She was under excruciating pain. But while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit said to me, don't finish your preaching. Some woman is dying with a dead fetus in her womb. You announce divine healing. In the middle of my sermon, I usually do not stop my preaching, but I said, sorry people, some woman here has a dead fetus in her womb and she is also dying, being poisoned. And I tell you in the name of Jesus Christ, God is quickening the dead fetus and things are going to be all right. Then I continued my sermon and I forgot all the story. And a few months ago on Sunday, a lady brought an 18 year old young girl and she says, Pastor, I want to testify before people. I said, what do you like to testify? That Sunday, 18 years ago, I was dying with dead fetus in my womb. And I was having an excruciating pain. Then suddenly you stopped your preaching. You said, some woman here is dying with dead fetus in the womb. And she said, I was that woman. Instantly I was quickened. And I went back to hospital. And uh, they x-rayed, and the fetus came alive. This is my girl there. She's 18 years old. You know, if I had not listened to the voice of Holy Spirit, her child and she would have died. So we must have the ear to hear the voice of Holy Spirit. Since I operate the newspaper, I receive news from all over the world. And I once received a very interesting news. Some of the African brethren, they got together and they had a prayer meeting. And then they said, well, Jesus Christ and Peter walked on the water. We have the same Jesus. Why don't we walk on the water? So they studied Bible. They were uh, emboldened by the scripture. So. They took the boat and they rode into the middle, deep middle part of the lake. Ten of them jumped out of the boat and all were drowned. That came as a news to a newspaper company. And the reporters came to me. They said, how come? They believed the word, but they were all drowned and they dead, died. I said, this is news. And they said, Pastor, you always ask us to believe God. How come? They believe. So I said, you have a great misunderstanding. They, they stood up on the logos. God never spoke them to come out of the boat. God commanded Peter to come out of the boat. He had the rhema. They had direct word from the Lord. But they had logos. They only studied the Bible. So they did not receive faith. So they were drowned. That's the difference. You know, even in divine healing, many diabetics, I do never ask diabetics not to take insulin. I say, pray till you listen, hear from the Lord. When the Lord speaks to your heart to stop receiving the insulin, 
then start believing. But don't stand on the written word. The written word is given to everybody under heaven. This is potential blessing of God, not practical blessing of God. But when you pray very much, then the Spirit will turn this logos into the rhema to you. Then that scripture belongs to you. You may risk your life on it. So brothers and sisters, we should pray very much till the Spirit speak into our heart. So I pray always when I come to showbread, thank you for Logos. But please give my daily rhema. Please give me your word directly to me so that I may launch out by faith. Then I come to the middle part of the altar. There is incense altar. There uh, the priest burn incense every day to the Lord. There I give all the praise to the Heavenly Father. I praise the Heavenly Father. He's a God in heaven and on earth, and he is almighty, omniscient, and omnipresent. And I praise his name. Then I go through the curtain. I go to the Holy of Holy. Then I see the, the Ark of Covenant, and I see the, the sprinkled blood of Jesus Christ. There I worship God. I am now in Holy of Holy. So I say, oh God, I worship this blood. This blood took away all the sin, brought the righteousness of God in my life. And this blood destroyed the kingdom of devil, disarmed. And this blood canceled the law and condemnation. And this blood assures me that by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ, I become righteous and saved. So I praise God, I'm saved through faith in Jesus Christ. There I worship God. Since I am now directly in the presence of God, there now I begin to pray all of my need. So I call this uh, 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 tabernacle prayer. I was lecturing to the uh, Taiwanese pastors and about prayer. And instantly, in a split second, God opened my mind. And God said, pray according to tabernacle prayer. In Old Testament, Israelite, they were all commanded to come to tabernacle to pray. They were not permitted to go to any other places, but to tabernacle to pray. He said, all of those things are symbolic to the New Testament Christian, shadow to New Testament Christian. He says, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the tabernacle. You don't need to go to any other places. But through you, you must pray according to the tabernacle. So I am tabernacle now. So in my heart, in my thoughts, I come to the brazen altar, the cross of Jesus Christ. There I worship the blood. In my heart, I come to the labor and I confess all of my sins. So in my heart, I come to the holy place, golden candlestick, worship the Holy Spirit. I worship the showbread. I worship God. Then in my heart, I enter into the holy of holy place, and I worship my Heavenly Father. Because your spirit is analogous to the holy of holy. Your mind is analogous to the holy place. And your physical body is analogous to the courtyard. And so God is dwelling in your spirit. And you, why do you come to this seminar? to renew your mind, holy place. You can't do anything about your holy of holy, your spirit, you are born again, the Holy Spirit in the world there. But you are here to renew the holy place, your mind. The Holy Spirit in your spirit come through your mind, through your courtyard, and go to the people. So when the spirit want to move out of your spirit, but when your mind is not renewed, your mind blockade by disobedience and sanctification and by uh, love of faith. You blockade the power of the Holy Spirit in holy places. The Holy Spirit want to flow through the, from holy of holy through the holy place. And the holy place, your mind should be renewed. Bible says iron sharpens iron. So we are sharpening each other, you know. Tonight I'm sharpening you and you sharpening me. So we are renewing our mind, holy place. Then the Holy Spirit freely flow through the Holy, Holy, your spirit, through your mind, through your physical body, and minister to the people. Don't think that God is a million miles away. Bible says, don't say the kingdom of God is here and there. The kingdom of God is in you. 
since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, kingdom of God has come into your own heart. Your spirit is the holy of holy. Your mind is holy place. Your body is courtyard. And so you must be very careful. You are the kingdom of God. I always say to my Christian, you are the mini kingdom of God. So when you go back home, you take bus, you say to yourself, the kingdom of God is taking the bus. <laughs> and when you come home, you should say, the kingdom of God has arrived at home. We are the kingdom of God. Yeah. So when we pray, we pray according to the tabernacle. So I, I praise God before the, uh, uh, the, 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 the incense altar. Then I enter into the holy place. Then I see the covenant, Ark of Covenant, see the blood, Jesus, and worship the blood. Since I come to the direct presence of God, I can offer all other prayer there. So every day I pray according to this tabernacle prayer. And this is so powerful. To pray thoroughly according to this uh, tabernacle prayer, it takes at least 30 minutes to one hour. And uh, I call this uh, prayer jogging course. When you jog, you always decide the course. 10 minutes jogging, 30 minutes jogging, one hour jogging. So in my personal life, I've developed many prayer jogging course. I have 15 minutes jogging course, 30 minutes to one hour jogging course, this tabernacle prayer. I have more than one hour jogging course, the Lord's Prayer. Then I have a marathon course also. God has developed this prayer course, and I use this prayer course. Otherwise, you can pray every day more than three, 30 to one hour. You become tedious, and you, you, you can't pray. But when you decide this jogging course of prayer, you pray same course, and your prayer becomes very powerful. My prayer life becomes so powerful because I pray every day according to tabernacle prayer. I come to the brazen altar and I worship blood. All of our prayers should start from the blood, blood of Jesus Christ. So I worship blood abundantly. Then I come to the labor and I confess all of my sin. Every day I confess all of my sin, cleanse myself. Then I enter the holy place. I worship the Holy Spirit. I have fellowship. I have deep, deep fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Then I go and praise the word of God and ask God to give me a rhema. Then I worship God at the intense altar. Then I enter into the Holy of Holy through the broken body of Jesus Christ. Then I worship the blood, covenant. And then I pray for my family, for my church and everything. And God answers me. I always feel the tingling presence of Holy Spirit when I finish the tabernacle prayer. And brothers and sisters, practice this tabernacle prayer. This will help and enhance your prayer life 100% tremendously. I always practice this uh, tabernacle prayer. And this helps me so much. Well, I think I should conclude my message now. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry that I could not carry out my planned message. I had more academic, well-planned, Wonderful message, but God just changed the whole program. And but praise the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful.